All right. So I talked to the uh, building people and they said the only way to make this room warmer is body heat. So you just have to invite more guys. It's the only way we'll get warmer. So hopefully you brought your coats. What's that? All right. So uh, next week is our last week for this uh, year. And so then we'll start back up January 8th. So you can mark your calendars and be ready and prepared for that. So uh, one more lesson. Uh, next week and then not until January. But uh, it's good to see everybody. We've got a lot to cover tonight. So I'm just going to get started. I think the first thing you might notice in your Bible is that uh, the first 11 verses or so of John, that's like verses 1 to 11 of chapter 8, are in italics or maybe brackets. Uh, depends on your, your Bible as to how they handle it. But um, Likely there's included some sort of statement, too, that says the earliest manuscripts of John don't include this passage. And this is true. The earliest manuscripts do not include the encounter with the woman caught in adultery. And this may be troubling to you to kind of consider, but it actually uh, should be comforting to you to know that there are many, many early manuscripts from the original writings of Scripture that are accurate and are consistent. And so we can be confident in knowing that what we read was what was really written. And in fact, um, the, the, the fact that those who published the Bible and uh, were able to freely state that this section is somewhat in question means that we can be confident that all the other stuff we read is not in question. And as your notes state, there's little doubt that this event with the woman caught in adultery actually existed, uh, that, that this is um, very likely a genuine episode that happened in Jesus's ministry, but it wasn't originally included in John. So from a teaching standpoint, it's difficult to know what to do with this. And since we're studying John's gospel, and it's pretty clear that this was not part of the original text, I'll just kind of cover it briefly, um, not draw a lot of major doctrinal conclusions from this passage, however. But as you read, uh, the Pharisees set a trap for Jesus. They found a woman who was caught in adultery. They brought her before Jesus to ask what should be done. The penalty for adultery was the death penalty. And Jesus, as we see him often do, outsmarts the Pharisees. He tells them that uh, uh, whoever is without sin should cast the first stone. Well, as you know, no one throws a stone. Instead, they all walk away. Then Jesus tells the woman that he does not condemn her, but she must leave her life of sin. This story reflects the grace of God to forgive, uh, but it also demonstrates our need to respond to faith or to, um, to Jesus with faith and with repentance and with obedience. So um, the remainder of the chapter we're going to look at in two divisions, though. That will be verse 12, uh, light of the world. And then verses uh, 13 to 59 from chapter 8, valid testimony. So a big section there. But there's plenty to look at here in John 8. And um, based upon Jesus' teaching here, we have some really big things to think about. Light, darkness, judgment, law, human standards versus heavenly standards, life, death, being from above, being from below, true discipleship, obedience, the father of lies, God's glory, Christ's preexistence. And you thought studying John was going to be easy. This is just one chapter. But let's sort of get the lay of the land. In John uh, 6, we, you remember, was the first of the I am statements. Jesus was proclaiming to the people that I am the bread of life. And this was around the time of the Passover festival. So it's about one year before Jesus would be crucified. In chapter 7, as uh, Jordan pointed out last week, Jesus then traveled back to Jerusalem for the Festival of Tabernacles. And John's not always perfectly written chronologically, but this would have been about six months before Jesus was to be crucified. And Jordan described the role of water. Uh, in the festival of the tabernacles, in the ceremony that they would perform. And uh, there was this powerful moment we looked at last week where Jesus said in John 7, 37 and 38, 
Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And Jesus was referring to uh, the living water of the Holy Spirit. So I think often we uh, like to, uh, as we're trying to sort through life, trying to figure out our own way, figure out what the path is, the way to, as you can, you could even consider, figure out our way through the darkness. We often trust in our own wisdom, or we trust in the wisdom of the world. We find a, a book, or we find somebody else's advice to kind of help us through. And uh, tonight we're going to see that our guide, our path through the darkness, is is Christ, who is the light of the world. And if you look in your Bible, as the narrative flows, if you were had your finger at John seven thirty nine. I think as the, the narrative text, you could probably jump straight from there to John 8, 12. In verses 40 to 52 of chapter 7, the, the, the last part of chapter 7, it's sort of the response to what Jesus had said, of what some of the other people were, how they, how they reacted to what he said. But when it says in John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again, again, just follows Jesus' teaching about this rivers of living water. So it's like he talks about rivers of living water, and then it goes straight into Jesus as the light of the world. So let me read verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is not the first time that we uh, see the word light used in Scripture. I mean, even from the very beginning pages of Genesis, light is associated with life. It's associated with creation. For the Israelites who were wandering in the desert, God gave them light in the form of the pillar of fire to guide them along their way. So their light was a guide for them. Psalm 27, 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So it was a sense of protection and comfort that came with the light. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Again, a guide. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verse 6, this is the second of the servant songs in Isaiah. God speaks about his servant, and he says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So hundreds of years before Jesus, Isaiah promised that the Messiah would come as light. And not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. That he would reach all peoples, that this light would reach the ends of the earth. And Jesus is saying, I am the light of the world. I am that light. Light shows the way through the darkness. The coming of Christ illuminated the way through the darkness. Like the pillar of fire in the desert, like the lamp to the feet, this light shines to the ends of the earth. Jesus is the light, the light of the world. So as this festival, uh, or at this festival of tabernacles, Jordan talked about last week how they have this elaborate ceremonial usage of water where they take the, the flag on from the um, pool of Siloam and then bring it up to the temple and they would do this every night and it was this elaborate thing. But also during the same uh, festival, they would light four huge lamps uh, in the temple courts and there would be a celebration then that would take place under these lights. It would light up the whole area. And here's how this has been described. Men of piety and good works dance through the night holding burning torches in their hands and singing songs and praises. The Levitical orchestra is cut loose, and some sources attest that this went on every night of the Feast of the Tabernacles, with the light from the temple area shedding its glow all over Jerusalem. I mean, we're so accustomed to light, we see it all the time. That's no big deal, but for them to be able to light up the city was a huge celebration. And this is the context, it's context in which Jesus proclaimed, I am the light of the world. In fact, one of the scriptures that the people would read during the festival 
was Zechariah 14, 5 to 7, where it says, Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. On that day there will be neither sunlight nor cold, frosty darkness. It will be a unique day, a day known only to the Lord, with no distinction between day and night. When evening comes, there will be light. And then that passage goes on. It says, on, uh, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem, half of it east to the Dead Sea and half of it west to the Mediterranean Sea. In summer and in winter, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. So Christ is the light of the world. Do you understand and celebrate the light that Jesus is? He's perfect and pure, glowing with majesty and glory, bright and vibrant, full of life. Jesus describes himself to be the only remedy for the darkness of sin, for he alone is the light. Well, we bought we brought our uh, Christmas tree up from the basement this week. And we've embraced the beauty of the artificial tree that doesn't shed its needles. It's not needy. It doesn't need to be watered. It doesn't fall over when you can't get it just perfectly right. And uh, also artificial trees come pre-strung with lights. And this year we set up the tree. We put on the direct decorations. We plugged in the tree and no lights. The lights stop working. So the joke's on us, right? Our Hobby Lobby purchase from four years ago let us down. I'll tell you, you can put all the ornaments you want on a Christmas tree, but without shining lights, it just looks depressing. <laughs> but notice also that when, uh, when this, what this verse says about those who follow Jesus, whoever follow me will never walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Um, every word is important here. And this promise is a great hope. There's a beacon of light and it is Christ, like a Christmas tree with lights that work. And the promise is for those who follow Jesus. Followers, as we continue to see, are these true disciples or these true believers. They follow Christ. So following Christ involves committing ourselves wholly and entirely to him as our leader, as our savior. It involves submitting ourselves to him in everything. And, you know, we get stuck in the darkness sometimes. We try to get our, our out on our own. We thought, well, maybe I got myself into this. Maybe I can get myself out of it. We need to trust in the light of the world. It's clear that the followers are following Jesus. They're not following anything else. He said, whoever follows me, that's who we're to follow. We're to follow Jesus. And for those who follow Jesus, then they will never walk in darkness. This doesn't imply that Christians will never sin, but they know the way through the darkness. It is Christ. We don't need to grope about in, the, in doubt of what may come. Through Christ, those in Christ will see the light of heaven. We know where we are going. And Christ himself assures us that we will have the light of life. First principle. Jesus is the way through the darkness of sin. Jesus is the way through the darkness of sin. The book of John's already shown us a lot about light. Even in the prologue in chapter 1, it said, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John 3.19, Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. And now it's clearly stated that Jesus is the light of the world. Those who follow him will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If you are in Christ, you are no longer walking in darkness. 
Sin does not have the same appeal to you that it once did. Your future is certain and secure. Christ is the light that produces life, real life, and eternal life. Is Christ your light? Have you committed yourself to following Jesus? He is the light of the world. And believe it or not, we're going to have a lot more to say about Jesus being the light of the world even next week when we look at the healing of the blind man versus the persistent spiritual blindness of the Pharisees. But the second division then is the remaining verses of the chapter. And these verses cover many topics, but ultimately they revolve around one, which is the validity of Jesus' testimony, which is really what the Pharisees bring up initially, is they don't trust Jesus. So um, kind of structurally, if you look at the pattern, there's sort of a pattern to these verses, and I think it helps to make some sense of things. Jesus makes several statements in these next several verses, and then what happens is he makes a statement, the Pharisees challenge what he says, and then Jesus gives a rebuttal. Sometimes then it goes back and forth and Jesus makes, they make another challenge, then Jesus makes another rebuttal. But if you look at just, for instance, verse 12, Jesus makes a statement, I am the light of the world. Then in verse 13, it says the Pharisees challenged him. Then Jesus offers a response that starts in verse 14. Then down in verse 19, the Pharisees challenge him again. And then Jesus gives a rebuttal again in verse 19. So that pattern kind of continues throughout the rest of the chapter. And you probably notice that the tension really starts to rise throughout the chapter. It just gets more and more intense. And uh, first, the Pharisees, they just think Jesus' claims are not valid. But by the end, they will have accused him of being suicidal, of being a liar, of being demon-possessed, of being a Samaritan. And then they try to stone him. So how do the Pharisees then respond to Jesus' claim of being the light of the world? Verse 13, the Pharisees challenged him. Here you are appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. So they don't believe Jesus. It seems that this sets the tone for all of the other arguments. They don't believe Jesus is the light of the world. If they did, They would have responded differently to everything else he says. Instead, they fight him tooth and nail. It's like if someone's trying to sell you a timeshare or something like it, and it just sounds too good to be true. And you don't really believe their sales pitch. So you keep asking question after question, challenging every little point in order to find out where is this deal a fraud? I know this deal is a fraud. Well, maybe the timeshare deal is a fraud. That's for you to decide. But Jesus is not a fraud. And the sooner you figure that out, the better. So they say, you are your own witness and we don't trust you. Jesus says he doesn't need any other witnesses because he spoke it. And since he spoke it, it is true. Verse 14, Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I'm going but you have no idea where I came from or where I'm going. The testimony of Jesus is valid. And he points out that the Pharisees are really in no position to judge. Well, why? Well, first of all, they have no idea where Jesus came from or where he's going. And secondly, they judge by human standards. Jesus does not judge by human standards. That's what it means when it says that uh, uh, I pass judgment on no, on no one. When Jesus says, I pass judgment on no one, he doesn't judge by the superficial human standards. But he, ju- he does judge. Uh, John 5, 27 tells us that the Father gave the Son authority to judge. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But the very presence of Jesus divides humanity around him. And his decisions are true. He is perfect and he is just, and he is a judge who is never mistaken or wrong in his judgments, unlike the Pharisees who were judging Jesus completely wrong. Verse 18, I am one who testifies for myself. 
My other witness is the Father who sent me. So the testimony of Jesus is more than enough. But just to be clear, Jesus has a second witness, his own Father, who, by the way, is God himself. In verse 19, Jesus said, If you knew me, you would know my Father also. You cannot separate out the components of the Trinity. Jesus and the Father are one. You cannot believe in one and not the other. Verse 20 reminds us of the context then a little bit. And Jesus uh, shows Jesus was teaching in the temple courts. He was able to continue teaching because his hour had not yet come. And then the next statement from Jesus comes in verse 21. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away. And you will look for me, and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. Again, the Jews really misunderstand Jesus. They think maybe he's going to kill himself. But then Jesus is very clear by what he means in verses 23 and 24. He continued, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Here Jesus is remarkably clear. Jesus is from above. Mankind is from below. God is holy. Man is not. Man is made in God's image, but we are not the same. We are not God. His, he is something completely other than us. He is from above. He is perfect and holy, and he is set apart. And then God gives this warning. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. So the God of the universe is stating what is the penalty for sin. It is death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Our sin and our sinful nature is an offense to the holy God. The penalty of sin is death. This means actual physical death came about because Adam and Eve disobeyed God and entered into sin. And this means that the penalty for sin also is spiritual death. Separation from God. Being subject to God's wrath and torment from Satan. Matthew 13, 40 to 42 says, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus knows the truth. He is from above. He knows the end from the beginning, and he knows that if you do not believe in him, you will die in your sins. The one who says, this is the one who is the savior of mankind, the one who laid down his own life for his sheep, is the one talking. Christ himself, the gracious and compassionate king, he knows that if you do not believe in him, you die in your sins. To contrast that with the next statement, Verse 31, to the Jews who had believed him, so some had believed, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So verse 30 tells us that there were some who believed. And verse 31 demonstrates the nature of true discipleship involves obedience to Christ. Do you see that? Disciples of Jesus hold to his teaching. Sometimes people get this wrong and think that if you have believed, you're just somehow done. You did what you needed, and that's it. But that's not the case at all. You're not really a disciple of Jesus if you don't hold to Jesus' teaching. And notice that the freedom that people want People love to quote this verse because they want to talk about freedom. But the freedom comes through obedience to Jesus. Specifically, the freedom 
The truth that will set you free is the good news of Jesus. If you hold to Jesus' teaching that you must believe in Christ to do for you what you can't do for yourself, believing that Christ made the perfect sacrifice for you, and is in so doing defeated the penalty of sin and defeated death and Satan, and that Christ was raised and he reigns and he's preparing a place for you, and he will return to fully establish his rule and reign. That is the truth that will set you free. It's not telling your boss that you cut out 15 minutes early that will set you free. It's not that truth. It is the blood of Christ that sets you free. It is the belief in the sacrifice of Jesus and submission to his will for your life that sets you free. And you might think this is being overly dramatic. I don't need to be set free. I'm my own man. In fact, I'm an American. What's more free than that? Well, the Jews thought the same thing in verse 33. We've never been slaved of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus explains that the ultimate enslavement is the enslavement to sin. And in fact, we are all born slaves to sin. Verse 34, <clears throat> Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. This is Romans 3.23. In many other places in Scripture, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all born in sin, and therefore we are born into the slavery of sin. And, we, and, and what do we know then about sin as our taskmaster? One author said it this way. There is no slavery like this. Sin is indeed the hardest of all taskmasters. Misery and disappointment along the way, despair and hell in the end. These are the only wages that sin pays to its servants. To be in rebellion against the God who created you is the ultimate bondage. And it is the work of Christ that sets you free from the bondage to sin. Verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Jews thought that since they were the sons of Abraham, that that, that ensured their right standing with God. Well, no, that was not the case. They were slaves to sin, just like anyone who's ever been born. And Jesus was telling them that they needed to be set free. Jesus says in verse 40, As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Jesus goes on to tell them in verse 44, that because Abraham was their father, does not make God their father. In fact, they belong to the devil. The devil is their father. The father of lies. A murderer from the beginning. A liar. The one who seeks to deceive us and to destroy us at every opportunity. Those who reject Jesus do not have God as their father. In fact, they have the devil as their father. Only those who love Christ have God as their father. And no surprise, but the Jews don't like this. They accuse Jesus of being a Samaritan and a demon-possessed man. And this tension is rising in this conflict. Then verse 50. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. Jesus makes his final statement in this series of statements. 
The Jews are livid. The tension continues to rise, starting in verse 52. At this they exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him. And you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Abraham lived nearly 2,000 years before Jesus. For Jesus to claim that before Abraham was born, I am, was truly remarkable. This means that Jesus is the pre-existent one. He has always been. He existed before the earth was formed. Colossians 1.17, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus didn't come into existence in a manger in Bethlehem. He's always existed. Jesus is equating himself with God. And this is why the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross was effective. Because it wasn't some mere man giving his life. It was the pre-existent God. The one to whom all glory is due. Jesus was revealing the truth to these Pharisees. And they wanted to kill him for it. And they didn't believe in Jesus. And they were in no way interested in giving Jesus the glory that he deserves. What glory have you taken for yourself that belongs to God? He is the one to be exalted. He is the one to be praised. Second principle. Freedom from sin comes only through Christ. Freedom from sin comes only through Christ. So what have we learned in this chapter? We've learned that the world is dark. If you do not believe in Jesus, you will die in your sins. We are born slaves to sin. Those who reject God have the devil as their father. But we've also learned that a light has shined in the darkness. Jesus, the light of the world. The promises for the believer in Christ are astounding. They will never walk in darkness. They will have the light of life. They will be set free from the slavery to sin. God is their father. Their father. They will never see eternal death, for they will have the light of life. Is that what you think about throughout the day? I have the light of life. I'm no longer enslaved to sin. God is my father. This is the path through the darkness. Jesus is the light that brings us through the darkness. Whatever the darkness is you're experiencing today, the answer is Jesus. The light that has secured your eternity. The father of lies has no dominion over you. For you belong to Christ. Let's pray.
Lord, you are holy and you are perfect. Your word is true. Your ways are just. You're the light of the world. You shine darkness into our lives, bringing us to knowledge and understanding of you. Thank you and praise you for your kindness and your grace and sending your son on our behalf to restore us in relationship with you, to assure our eternity with you, a hope that will not disappoint. Thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. See you next week, guys. Thank <laughs> you.